Good morning, everyone, and Happy New Year. Now, this is the time of year that many people begin to make their New Year's resolutions, trying to make some changes in their lives to maybe better their lives, improve things. You may decide that you want to start a new diet plan today or a new exercise program. I know Kelly and I, we've decided that we're going to start a diet, maybe some exercise, at least for the first three days of this year. You may even decide you want a new savings plan or maybe even a new job. But have you thought about a new me for the new year? What does it really mean to be a Christian? You know, when you ask people out in the world today, you will get many varied answers as to what a Christian really is. But it doesn't matter how many views you might get from somebody, no matter how good they may sound, the Bible view is the only correct view. In the Bible, we only read the name Christian three times, all of them, of course, found in the New Testament. The first time we see that name Christian is found in Acts 11, verse 26. And there it says, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Here, the new relationship of the Christian is in view. The next time we see this name is given by uh, where Apostle Paul is talking to King Agrippa. In Acts chapter 26, verse 28, as Paul talks to King Agrippa about his soul, he tells Paul, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And here, the new character is in view. And then finally, we read of the, Christian, the name Christian, 1 Peter 4, 16. The Apostle said, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And here the new way of the Christian is in view. Now clearly a person cannot become a Christian without him understanding the steps that it took to become a Christian. Remember J.D. Tent. He was an old frontier preacher who preached during the early 20th century up in the Panhandle area of Texas. And every time he would go to a different town to do a meeting for them, he would go about and talk the, to the people on the streets, especially the young children, and teach them the five-finger plan of salvation. You first have to hear, hear the word, because that's how faith comes, Romans 10, 17. He says you have to believe, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. In fact, Jesus said himself, if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins, John 8, verse 24. Then he said you have to repent. Repentance is simply a change of mind that brings about a change of action and direction. In other words, it is to change your life. Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then he said you have to confess. That's the fourth one. Confess what? Confess Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I will also deny you before my Father, which is in heaven, Matthew 10, 32, and 33. And then the final step is to be baptized. Just like the waters, the flood waters, saved Noah and his family by lifting them up above the destruction that went on underneath, in like manner, baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. But you know, it's also important for us as Christians to grow in our understanding by looking back at what the people of the first century did to become Christians. For instance, the first century people became Christians when they trusted in Christ, having heard the word of truth, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. They also became Christians when they received the, the word of God, and they did so obediently, 1, Timothy, or 1 Thessalonians 2.13. And then they also became Christians when they became enlightened, tasted of the heavenly gift, became partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted of the good word and the power of the world to come, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. So in light, in light of what the Bible teaches us about being a Christian, there are some questions we ought to think about, some things that we need to meditate upon. For example, what did I do to become a Christian? Can I name the specific steps that I did to become a Christian? 
Also, what did I receive? What blessings came to me because of this? And then, what are the implications and the consequences of what I have done? Remember now, there is responsibility upon us. And then, what happened to me? And then we need to ask ourselves, what have I become? Now, you ought to see a change. What have you become that is different than what you were before? What is the meaning, the significance, the importance, the value of now of being a Christian? And now, what must I do? <clears throat> These matters have a lot to do with the Christian's sense of identity. And we're not going to be successful Christians until we have the right slant on ourselves. Remember, our greatest need is to be and not to have. You see, a distorted self-image of ourself will cause us to project a distorted image of what a Christian really is to those who are outside of Christ. And as you all know, there's many misunderstandings in the religious world today, and even misunderstandings of what we ought to be. So the world desperately needs more people who are truly Christians, and those who truly understand what it means to be a Christian. So let's look at the proper view of what a Christian should be. Now, the Christian needs to think of his life now as a new life. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, that when we come up out of the waters of baptism, we are risen to walk in newness of life. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, he says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now, this newness it has nothing to do with the outward man, with the physical part. It all has to do with the spiritual. And this newness has to do with the inward man. And I think Paul made this very clear in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, when he said, Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Now, the character of the inward man, of course, is the most important thing. And it really distinguishes us from other people. If you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And while you're turning there, I want to relate to you a story about Alexander the Great. Now remember, he conquered most of the known world way back then, by the time he was only 21 years old. And yet he established one of the greatest world empires, the Grecian Empire. And he saw Diogenes, who was a philosopher, and he was attentively looking at a parcel of human bones. And he asked this philosopher what he's looking for. And his reply to Alexander was, that which I cannot find, the difference between your father's bones and the bones of his slaves. When he was looking at the physical part of man, he noticed that there wasn't just a whole lot of difference from one human being to the next, especially when you're looking at the skeleton. So physically, we're a lot alike. But I want you to look at what Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 9. Look at verses 2 and 3. He says, All things come alike to all. There's one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean and to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner. And he that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil, and the madness is in their heart while they live. After that, they go to the dead. Now drop down to verse 11. He says, I return and saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to them all. For man also knoweth not his time. As the fishes that are taken in an evil net and the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. Now, Solomon is mainly looking at the physical aspect of life here, not the spiritual aspect. And he's troubled as he views death. He notices that it does come to all people. It doesn't matter how old they are how healthy they may be, how young or old, it doesn't matter. He says also that death can come unexpectedly. It doesn't matter your situation that you're in. 
So there's something more important to be concerned with than physical life. We learn this from the book of Ecclesiastes, and that is the new life that we have in Christ Jesus. So as Christians, we have to value the renewal of our thinking. As Paul commanded us in Romans 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Also, in Ephesians 4.23, he says, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So, in effect, a Christian is a new creation from top to bottom, from inside to outside. Paul said this in Galatians 6.15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And when Paul says a new creature, that word new comes from the Greek word kainos. It doesn't mean something old that is wrapped in new paper, but it is something completely never known before, brand spanking new. At one time, we lived for the world. We lived like the world. We lived with the world. But now we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. So if we're going to be a Christian with a hope of heaven, then we cannot live like we used to live before. Now we have to live 100% for Christ because of all that he has done for us. Now as Christians, we are a new person now because now we've been born again. Now the born, born again Christian is not a special kind of Christian because if you have not been born again, you're not a Christian at all. I want you to notice some of the requirements that we have to go through to obtain this new birth. Now, in his conversation with Nicodemus at night, listen to what Jesus told him in John chapter 3, verse 3 and following. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, that confused Nicodemus. He says, Can a man enter again the second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Jesus had to explain it a little bit further in verse 5. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Paul told Titus, the preacher, that Jesus saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. This new birth that he's talking about, of course, is by the word of God. The apostle Peter makes that very plain in 1 Peter 1, 23. He says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now this new birth also requires water or washing. Therefore we see Ananias telling Saul of Tarsus, and why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. So as we just seen, this new birth requires the word of God. We have to be baptized according to the teachings of the Holy Spirit. It requires much more than just getting wet. Now in this new birth, we are brought from death to life. The Christian is now alive in the truest sense. Listen to what Jesus said in John 5, verses 24 and 25. He says, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. But we have to hear, and we have to do something with that hearing. Let's take our Bibles now, let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. This is a passage that we're all familiar with. You've heard it many times. Many of y'all can just quote this without even looking at it. But I want you to look at how Paul says we obtain this life. In Romans chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 3. He says, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. 
knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now drop down to verse 23. He says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he pretty much told the Colossian church the same thing in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, or 12 and 13. He said, Buried with him by baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together. In other words, he has made alive with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. The Christian is much more than just alive in the flesh. We are alive in the spirit. And we were talking about eternal life. You can think about eternal life, not just in the future, but also in the present. Now we know that we have the hope of eternal life. Paul talks about this in Titus chapter 1, verse 2. That's talking about the future life that we have in heaven one day. But the Apostle John in 1 John 5, 13 says you have eternal life. This is a present tense verb, meaning we have it now. In other words, we possess life because we possess Christ, who is life. But it is contingent upon us possessing him. Yes, all Christians, we can say with great confidence that we have passed from death unto life. But also in this new birth, we're brought from darkness to light. The reason John or Jesus sent Paul to the Gentiles is found in Acts 26, 18. The purpose was to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they might receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith. Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians 5, 8, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There's a certain way that we are to walk as Christians. You know, God is light, 1 John 1 verse 5. And it's sin that separates us from that light, Isaiah 59 verse 2. So let us not return to that darkness, but let us ever walk in the light. And here's something else about this new birth is it places us into Christ. It puts us into a certain location. In fact, Paul says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, Galatians 3.27. And then remember this, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, Romans 8 verse 1. All spiritual blessings are only in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1, verse 3. So why would you want to be anywhere else except in Christ? Now, as Christians, we also now have a new loyalty. The Christian is indeed a converted person. Conversion automatically involves change. This is what we call repentance. And that is change for the better, not for the worse. But when that change is successful, we can look back on it and we can call it then growth. Without genuine conversion, Christianity, of course, is useless. Now, Paul described the conversion of the Romans in Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. And he said, Know ye not that to whom you yield servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey? whether of sin and death or of obedience unto righteousness. And then he says, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that former doctrine which was delivered you, and then being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. There was a big change there from one serving sin to now serving righteousness. 
Can your conversion be described in like manner? Did you obey from the heart that form of doctrine? Are you now serving righteousness rather than sin? By God's grace, the convert to Christ has won a crucial victory. But we need to continue to make that victory good because it is possible we can fall from grace, Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. But just remember, the Christian's conversion has to do with Christ and his will. We're not converted to some man or some man's teaching. I want you to listen to the words of the Apostle Paul in Colossians 1, verses 3 through 4. He says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on the things of this earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. You see, we're activated by new values now as Christians. We decide our conduct by new criteria, understanding what the will of the Lord is, Ephesians 5, 17. So that old man that we used to be, it has disappeared. And now the new man has taken his place. And so the world no longer reigns preeminent in our eyes. Now we love God first and foremost above all else, Matthew 22, verses 37 and 38. You know, the Christian indeed is a person reborn. And we now have reason to think that we are a blessed people because we have all those spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. And the reason is because of the experience of becoming and being a Christian we now have our attention focused on more glorious things. Now that word hope takes on a whole new meaning. Remember, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Have you truly been converted to Christ? Have you taken those steps, those steps that J.D. Tant spoke of? It's not something he made up. It was all biblical. Hear the word. Believe the word that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the very Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess the sweet name of Jesus Christ and be baptized for the remission of your sins. It's the only way to be born again. If you haven't taken those steps, we encourage you to do so. It's the only way you can make it to heaven. You don't make it any other way. Now, if you are a Christian, have you lost your zeal as someone who is in Christ? Have you lost your vision of what it really means to be a true Christian? Have you become lackadaisical in your Christian walk? You know, we learn in Revelation chapter 3 that Jesus hates lukewarmness. Lukewarm Christians aren't going to make it. You have to be hot for the Lord. So let's start the new year right with a new me. And if there's anything that we can help you with to make that start, let that be known. Won't you come while together we stand and sing?